there's been a time for gathering the longhouse and sharing information around the fire. This is our contribution to that tradition. I'm going to talk about water procurement today. I always like to class what I'm talking about um, according to priority using the rule of threes. Uh, so a quick review, uh, three seconds if you give up, um, if you've lost your attitude, you die. Uh, three minutes, you lose air to your brain or you bleed out, you die. Three hours, you die of exposure. Three days, you die of, of water, lack of water. So as far as uh, survival priorities are concerned, that's a pretty important one. Now those are obviously a rough guideline, but to kind of get you thinking about how important things are. Um, and the first thing I should talk about is um, uh, what that really means, that three days with wa without water. We use water in two ways. One is metabolically, and that three days is how long you're going to last just metabolically, not moving, nothing else without water. Um, however, we use water in other ways as well. We also use water for cooling via sweat. So things that will affect our water usage uh, pretty significantly are if we're using it to cool ourselves, so if it's hot and we're moving in the heat, uh, or if we're exposed to the heat, uh, we're going to need a lot more water for cooling ourselves. Um, and um, that's also going to be a factor of uh, your surface area relative to your, your body size. That's something that, that always comes into play. The bigger you are, um, your, uh, your volume goes up as a cubic function, whereas your surface area goes up as a square. Bigger people, uh, like myself, I use a lot of water for cooling when it's hot. Uh, <clears throat> so in general, a uh, rule of thumb as far as um, your... Uh, your water usage, you need a gallon per day plus one quart per hour of exertion. Uh, that's kind of what I've figured out. Not doing a whole lot or just normal activities, a gallon. Uh, then for every hour I'm actually on the trail backpacking, I'm going to need another quart. Other people, the um, you know, other needs are going to vary. Um, and of course, ambient temperature due to cooling is going to affect that as well. Uh, one thing that I should mention, uh, because it's something I've experienced twice in my life, uh, it's easy when it's hot and you're using water for cooling, a lot of water for cooling, to wash all of the salts and electrolytes out of your system, uh, and you end up in a, a state that's called hyponatremia. You've been drinking plenty of water, but you haven't been eating anything um, or have anything to go along with it. Um, I like the heed um, uh, electrolyte. Um, powder that goes in water. When it's really hot I'll try to keep on top of that in addition to eating to try to keep myself um, from going hyponatremic. <clears throat> Alrighty, uh, what produces water? It's important to think about this because it's going to make you more savvy about finding water. Uh, first of all is the long cycle. In the mountains and you know most of what I'm talking about here is my experience base you know the western US, Alaska. Uh, basically it's snow melt that produces water. Most of our water comes down um, all winter long. It gets stored up here in snow banks like this one right behind me. And then all summer long, that's producing water via snow melt. Uh, so if you know what your long cycle looks like, is there a lot of snowpack up in the mountains or is there not a lot of snowpack? Uh, that's going to affect how much water there is that's available to find. And then, of course, the short cycle um, is there's the rain. Um, which is going to produce uh, temporary surges of water, depending upon how much rain there is. Uh, if you're going to be out in the back country, it behooves you not only to know what the long cycle looks like, but what the short cycle looks like. Have there been thunderstorms every hour where it is your, or every day where it is you're planning to go? If so, the uh, water system is more likely to be charged than not. Um, so if you know that ahead of time, that's a good thing. Uh, now, it's... Uh, for uh, snowmelt fed water sources, uh, basically you have a daily cycle of when there's going to be water available um, because it's the sun melting snow that drives, drives the water coming down. Uh, not much water comes down overnight, it takes the daytime to do it. So depending upon how close you are uh, to the snowbank, um, you know, if you're way, way downstream, 
you know, it might be that the water doesn't come through for 12 hours after the sun. Um, if I'm right down here below this snow bank, uh, basically as soon as the sun, sun starts melting the snow, the water is going to be available. Uh, in general, the highest water levels are going to be in the afternoon. <clears throat> Alright, so where do you find water? Um, first, best source is a map. Uh, know your map symbols, what a lake looks like, what a stream looks like, what a seasonal stream looks like, the dotted blue line that may or may not be there. Um, this, and that's going to be based on where you are in your long cycle. Uh, last year in the Rockies there wasn't much snow and stuff was dried up by August. This year this snow is going to be here when the snow flies again. It's like that all over the Rockies. So water all through August and, and September is much more plentiful this year. Um, but at any rate, so the seasonal streams that you find on a map this year have been pretty reliable. Um, and then the spring. So that's the first thing. If you got a map, you can figure out where these water sources are and follow it that way. Uh, the next thing that you're looking at, map or no map, is terrain. Uh, remember that water flows downhill, uh, so if you just think about water coming in via storms or water hanging up in these north-facing basins coming down through ravines, where's the water going to gather? Uh, it flows downhill, so look for relatively flat spots in an overall um, pitch slope because that's where water is going to collect more easily. This is true of the desert, the mountains, whatever. You're looking for these places that are um, uh, protected from the direct sunlight and um, are kind of flat spots in overall slopes. Uh, uh, deep canyons. Uh, the other thing up in the high country, uh, I don't know, you can't quite see. Well, yeah, the very tops of these mountains, scree slopes. Um, you'll find water running underneath of scree slopes. Uh, you listen for it and you can find it making its way down through the rocks. Um, and if you come to a water course or ravine, uh, and there's no water, don't give up. Go upstream or go downstream, kind of depending upon what your instincts and everything else tells you, uh, until you find that place where water is pooling or congregating. You may not find much, but you also don't need much when you're filling up. Uh, and then the other thing is uh, animals. Uh, animals have to have water. Um, if there's stock in the country, uh, you know, livestock, they've got to have water somewhere. So there may be a tank that a, that a rancher is replenishing uh, or a windmill driven trough or something like that. Uh, if you need water, that water is fair game. You know, just because it's animal water doesn't mean you shouldn't be drinking it. All right, which begs the question, is the water safe to drink? Uh, first thing we're worried about in water is floaters. Um, just big stuff that you don't really want to ingest. Um, and, you know, some of it maybe isn't harmful, uh, some of it is, but usually floaters are something you're concerned about. Um, and, and that can be organic matter and inorganic matter all the way down to silt. Um, my brother and I spent, uh, with our father, some time up uh, outside of Fairbanks doing some uh, hunting off of the river. And we were having, there was so much silt in the river uh, that we were having to... Um, let it settle in buckets overnight, pulling off the top, pre-filtering with a bandana. So even though it's not visible, there might be some crazy floaters in there. Um, oh, and then of course, the big one that we're worried about is Giardia and Crypto. Uh, that's, a lot of that comes from beaver dams, but basically it's, it's in animal feces. Uh, you need to assume it's in most North American water. Um, there, if you don't assume that, uh, you're just playing Russian roulette. I, I was on a backpacking trip once with a group of folks who, oh, we've been having water from, from this stream for years and years. It's safe to drink, um, and there's no reason to filter it. Well, I filtered it anyway, and uh, that year, that particular year, it wasn't safe to drink, and everybody got Giardia except for me. So uh, <laughs> it's uh, you're playing Russian roulette if you choose not to treat your water, uh, if it's not a known treated water source. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that, oh, and one thing I should mention as far as the Giardia and Crypto, when you're pulling water, those creatures tend to settle to the bottom in still water. So you might think, oh, this nice babbling brook has the best water. Really, you're looking for a spot where it slows and you're looking to pull off of the top because the, the organisms have settled to the bottom more likely. Um, and if you don't have a way of treating it, 
that may be your only option. We'll get to that later. Uh, and then viruses. Um, overseas, there's a lot of viruses. Uh, in America, there's starting to be more viruses. Um, there are, um, and then in civil emergencies, uh, you know, if you're trying to pull water from a municipal water supply, it might be compromised. So that's the other class of things you're worried about is viruses. Uh, and that'll come into play later when we talk about your treatment options. So, uh, what are, you, what are your treatment types? So first of all, there's filtration and there's purification. Filtration says that we're going to take some sort of filter element, we're gonna run the water through it, and we're gonna catch all those little organisms and viruses. Um, and then treatment says we're gonna chemically render all of those things inert. So there's, um, yeah, filtration, I'm sorry, purification says we're going to render all those things inert, usually chemically speaking. Um, so filtration, purification. Uh, so the, the first class of um, water treatment options is UV. Uh, flat out, they don't work. Uh, if you have a SteriPen, it's not doing anything for you. I know of two different um, actual lab tests that have proven that SteriPens don't do a thing. Um, and you say, oh, I've been using a SteriPen, it's been working great. The deal is, even heavily uh, Giardia infested water only has like one organism per cubic foot of water. So you can drink a lot of untreated water and never get hit by that organism. Uh, so you think your SteriPen's been working for you, it hasn't been. Uh, two different lab tests, one um, Overland Journal, journal uh, did a test in I think 2012, a uh, lab test. Uh, where they just simply could not get a SteriPen to, to treat water. Uh, the organisms kept multiplying, uh, and that was after two or three different units. Um, it just didn't work. Uh, our friend uh, Craig Cottle at Nature Reliance School out in Kentucky did lab tests using water samples provided by the state of Kentucky. And again, he found that the, uh, the UV-based methods, the SteriPens, simply did not treat water. So don't use them. They don't work. That's all there is to it. Um, so straining and settling. I was talking about letting the, the silt settle in the buckets up in Alaska. Um, if you have a way to let water settle, that's going to help. Straining, pouring it through a bandana or a silk handkerchief or even um, some kind of pre-filter that you cobble together with fabric or some kind of filter like that. Those won't get out Giardia and Crypto, but they'll get a lot of the floaters out. And if you get into a bad waterway, remember that you know, you're going to die without water in three days. So if you need water and don't have a way to treat it, you still need to drink the water. Uh, and so you can do the best you can by trying to pull off a still sources, trying to do some kind of filtration, rough filtration, using whatever fabric you have at hand, the finer the better. Um, that's something you can do. Boiling water does render it mostly safe to drink. Uh, you don't have to do it for a long period of time. Basically, once you've brought it to a rolling boil, it's reached the temperature necessary to kill organisms. Uh, I don't find it practical for trail use simply because I'm usually processing two or three quarts of water at a time. That requires a lot of fuel and a big pan. Uh, the chemical treatments, um, those are purifications. Uh, they take some time. Uh, what's nice about them is they're lightweight, they're compact. I carry some here in my kit bag. Um, you know, they're an easy thing to have. Uh, you have to wait, um, you know, 15 or 20 minutes, you know, follow the instructions on the package. Uh, they don't filter out any of the floaties, but they do render everything inert, including the um, viruses. So they're actually a purification and that's what's nice about them they're a great emergency thing heck you could even have some in your wallet um, uh, so there's chlorine dioxide which is how municipal water supplies are treated um, uh, the aquamuras the cotydons um, you know there's different brands but that's the one you want to use uh, the old bottles the iodan tabs that we all started using um, at least we did uh, they only get um, uh, GRD and not crypto. So you you don't need to use those anymore. If you find them in the Army Surplus store, they're a cool curio. Let's not use those anymore. Uh, bleach. Um, it's a good idea to stockpile bleach in a civil emergency um, 
you can use bleach to treat your drinking water. FEMA has instructions on its website for how to treat your uh, drinking water with bleach. It's, um, it's not necessarily the best long-term solution, but it's a great civil emergency solution, so make sure you got um, a bottle or two of bleach sitting by along with those FEMA instructions printed out so you know how to treat your water. So the next uh, major type of filtration or purification is the, uh, the filters, the mechanical filters. Uh, and there's some different types. One is gravity feed where you get a big bag of dirty water uh, and hang it from a tree or something in camp and let it just let gravity filter it through the element. It doesn't require much work, it requires a lot of time, um, but it's, it's kind of hassle free. You put your bottle underneath the where it's coming out of the filter element uh, and then you forget it's there and you come back a half an hour later and there's a bunch of clean water all over the ground but you got a, a full bottle which is pretty nice. Uh, squeeze filters. These are becoming really popular because they're compact and light. The idea is you get a bag of dirty water and you squeeze it through the filter element. Um, they're, uh, they're lightweight. The con is it's kind of hard to Basically, the, the block there is that you got to somehow get water into that dirty bag, which I'll get to in just a minute. Um, pump filters are the heaviest, um, and that's what we've always used, but you can pull from the tiniest water source. So um, I've been in plenty of situations where I'm following a ravine up and down, and finally I find like this little pool of water that's where water's coming up out of the ground that's maybe two inches deep. No way that I could get water from one of those into a dirty bag for either a gravity or a squeeze filter. But I can get my pump in there, you know, the intake to the pump, and I can pump that water up out of there. Um, or um, talus fields, if the water's running way below, you'd have to move a whole bunch of boulders to get down there to fill your squeeze filter. Uh, again, that's why I prefer a pump. Uh, but they are heaviest. Um, you know, they're heavy and cumbersome, and, and they also take up space. Uh, and then the other is the straws. Um, where you basically drink directly from the water source. They're nice because you get it right away. They're nice because you can get into a small uh, little spot, but you can't treat a bunch of water to carry with you. It's basically you get what you drink then, and that's it. Uh, they're a pretty nice emergency setup. <coughs> um, so uh, the models that we know and have used, one is the Katydon base camp, um, and that's a gravity filter, and we use those a lot, and they're good. Um, the pump filter I've been using, Sweetwater Guardian, no longer made. Uh, so when I uh, get to the end of the useful life on my last filter that I've stockpiled for it, I'm going to have to come up with something else. Um, and uh, the Sweetwater Mini, I've used those. I've got a couple of them. Uh, Again, I'm not a fan of the whole squeeze method, but they are light. It's nice to have in a day pack where I'm not really planning on treating water. Uh, one little trick that I found uh, for your intake bag, if you're looking to try to get some water into that, well, it's collapsed because you squeezed it last time. If you just kind of grab the, uh, the intake uh, and give it a good puff like that, it'll inflate that bag and it'll make it easier to dip water out of it. Uh, what's an even better choice is to find a, a bag, um, you know, the Sawyers I don't think come with these, at least the model I have doesn't. Find a bag that has a huge zip, zippered opening on the other end um, and then squeeze through that. Uh, when you have a bag like that that's dedicated dirty water, take a Sharpie, write dirty on the outside of it so that you don't ever accidentally use that for something else. Uh, that's just dedicated to dirty water. Um, mm, oh, and then really kind of the Cadillac of all of it, uh, the First Need XLE Elite. Uh, it is classed as a filter because it uses mechanical filtration, but it uses a proprietary method to do so that actually makes it a purifier. Um, and so it's, it's kind of hard to find these because there's no micron size, um, because it uses a completely different mechanism, uh, but it does work. Um, you know, a friend of ours lived once for, I don't know, two or three months in northern Iraq in this heavily polluted valley. He and his whole team were living off of the water coming out of his first need XLE, XLE Elite. He's used it down in South America in places where there were known viruses in the water. And incidentally, the people using UV filtration got sick. Um, and it's, it's just proven. Even, even though it's a... Um, it, it doesn't use the same kind of technology. It's proven, um, and 
the benefit is the flow is really fast on it too, just the mechanism that it uses um, to, to treat the water. Downside is it is a big heavy son of a gun. Um, you got to decide how important water is to you um, and how much you want to screw around trying to get the water um, to you. Now here's the thing that's super crucial. Uh, if you don't know how to completely service your water filter in the field, you do not have a water filter. If you get into, there's a whole lot of areas where that filter is going to get clogged up uh, almost daily. Um, sometimes you get by and it doesn't work like that, but often daily is how often it needs to be serviced. Um, the Sawyers have a backflow um, procedure that you use. Uh, the First Need has a backflow uh, procedure you use. Um, there's some that have... Um, where you scrub the filter element that's another method uh, either way you need to know how to break that all the way down and get it running again and also always carry the the chlorine chlorine dioxide tablets as a backup so that even if your primary water filter goes down you can still get the clean water that you need um, super crucial practice all that at home don't just read up on it you need to have gone through the procedure for doing that um, the frontier pro is a is a straw style purifier um, which i haven't personally used but people that i trust have and they like it um, problem being i don't know what the backflow procedure is or if there is one and just how heavily one would rely on that um, but it is for emergencies, drinking straight out of something, a good choice. All right, how do you carry your water? Um, we're, you know, if you know anything about hill, hill people gear, you'll know that we're uh, pretty anti-bladder. And that's just because bladders fail. Um, it's, you know, and maybe you throw your bladder away every year and replace it with a new one. Uh, recently I've been using Hydropack, or Hydropack. Uh, it hasn't failed me so far. Uh, the source out of Israel, they have, well, I've had two source bladders fail, but overall they have a good reputation. Um, we just tend to prefer bottles because they're not going to fail. Uh, we know how they work. Um, you know, it's just a safer way to carry water. Uh, that being said, there are some applications. It's important to be able to have your water easily accessible. You don't want to be taken off your pack. Um, to uh, have to get to your water, you won't drink enough if that's the case. So um, in those cases, I do use a bladder. And like I said, I've been using a hydro pack. Uh, even if I'm using a bladder, I always have backup water because eventually that bladder will fail. It's just kind of a truism, um, but they are convenient. So just hedge your bets if you're using bladders. And I do understand that there are times when bladders uh, are appropriate. So, the final thing, water, you know, water is life. Um, practice water respect. When you're in the back country, um, you know, don't, don't do your business urinating and everything close to the water. Go somewhere that's not going to filter directly into the water supply. Uh, the rule of thumb, I guess it's a couple hundred yards away. I don't know. You just use your head and think it through. Uh, don't be going anywhere it's going to get into the water supply directly. The other thing is, um, particularly in more arid environments out in the desert, animals need those water holes, you know, more than you do even. Uh, so um, don't camp right on a water hole. They're going to have to come in at night. And you don't want an animal not getting the water it needs because it's worried about coming past your camp. You also don't want to have a run-in with an animal because you've camped right where it needs to go to get water. You know, have your camp backed off from the water, you know, particularly in the desert uh, where there's only one water hole. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just don't set right on that. So um, you, you gotta you got to respect the water that you have. Um, so uh, that, that kind of is water procurement in some. There's a whole lot more detail. Um, that, that one could go into, but that's the top line. Uh, just remember how important water is, and um, when you're doing your trip planning, water is a huge part of your trip plan. How much do you need? Where are you going to get it? How reliable are those resupplies? Um, and you know, even if you go out for a day hike, um, make sure you have enough water with you. Remember the water requirements. Uh, a quart an hour of heavy exertion. So. Uh, don't don't come up short because you can get yourself in trouble really quickly on a hot day like that